So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Geist. Uh, I'm a law professor here and I'm standing in for uh, Marina, who's um, one of the co-directors of the Center for Law Technology and Society. I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to today's talk. It's nice to see a lot of you. It's great. Um, and so we are pleased to welcome back, because John's been here once before speaking, uh, John Walensky, who uh, for anyone who has been at all involved in issues associated with open access really needs no introduction. One of the true pioneers in the, in the field. If you have ever uh, gone online to an online journal uh, that's open access, uh, St. John, you have John in large measure to thank. He's been uh, a leader there. He's been a leader as part of this movement, as I say, for a couple of decades. And he has a new book coming out just in a few weeks' time. Yes. Um, that is going to make the case that perhaps the next stage for open access may include amending copyright. So it gets to this, this talk gets to bring together at least a couple of many of our favorite issues. Um, we've had the chance to spend a lot of time talking about it earlier today, and I think there's a lot of food for thought that will spark a lot of debate. Um, and so let me uh, hand it over to John. Okay. Thank you, Michael. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. So the idea that I would be part of the donuts for thought is a really good uh, aspect. And thanks for coming out. There's still some left if you want to come down at any point, um, or I could toss one out to you. <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. Um, I am here. There is a new book, um, but I'm not here to promote or sell the book. I've done that before in other times. It doesn't really work. Um, I'm really here to, uh, and notice the book title isn't even here. The, the book's title is The Copyright's Broken Promise. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about that broken promise, but I'm not promoting the book. Okay? In fact, here's my address. If you write to me, I'll send you the galleys, the final galleys, uh, to the book, and uh, it's going to be open access. And how could I talk about open access if I had a book that I was selling to you? Wouldn't that be kind of hypocritical um, and not untypical? Uh, no, that, that wouldn't be what I would be doing. The book uh, is open access, uh, part of an MIT program, MIT Press program. It's making books open. Um, and it's kind of an experiment that MIT is doing. It's called Direct to Open, uh, in which it gets libraries to pay uh, in advance for books uh, and gets, uh, sets a certain level for the book. Mine was relatively cheap but a certain level for the books, and if it obtains that much money from the libraries, it makes the book open to everyone. Isn't that a great idea? Uh, but if it doesn't get enough money, it doesn't make the book open. Um, and the libraries were supportive. My book was one of like 30 books this fall, although mine's the last. Um, the, the, some, most of them are already out, and I'm waiting until December 6th. Uh, maybe alphabetical, I don't know. What would be the reason that that would, that would be last? Um, so this, this whole concept of, of direct to open, and we sometimes call it subscribe to open, demonstrates that the libraries want open access so strongly that they will pay for non-exclusive access. They will pay to see the book published, and they don't lose anything if it's open access. In fact, they gain because it makes the scholarship public, and in a sense justifies their existence as a library. And so I want the law to support that, because the law doesn't currently support that. The law is not at all involved in this direct to open program that MIT Press is running. It's just an agreement between MIT Press and the libraries. And they took an experiment. And next year, they have to start over again. There's no legal assurance, as there is with subscriptions. If you subscribe to a journal, you get it every month. That's a lock-in, and you are legally protected by your contract, of course, but copyright is also protecting the library from other people getting access to that journal that don't subscribe, because that would be an infringement if they were to go and copy it and share it. So I'm looking for the law to catch up. I'm looking for the law to keep pace. And I want to describe to you, first of all, a case for changing the law, because um, I don't take that lightly. I'm new to this field, and I'm kind of a little naive about it, and it seems to me pretty onerous. I just had a chance to compliment Michael on the work that he's done for user rights in this country uh, in terms of fair dealing. Um, and I can appreciate that the law is a difficult entity. And our approach in scholarship has been to avoid touching it. It's too hot to handle. And we've worked around it in multiple ways that I'll describe in a moment. 
and I'm fed up. Because Taylor Swift changed the law. Because the video game owners of this world have changed the law repeatedly because satellite broadcast TV, whatever the heck that is, has changed the law. Copyright in the United States has been changed 60 times since the internet was introduced in 1989, and not once for research and scholarship. Now I understand, I've been teaching in the United States for 15 years, I understand the priorities of the United States, and locks on video games definitely comes before research. Unlocking cell phones, definitely more important than research. Satellite rocket, yes, I already mentioned that. Streaming, well, no argument for me there. <laughs> Change the law for streaming. But I think it's time for research and scholarship to be considered in the digital era as something that should be supported by copyright. And so let me set up this case for you. What I want to do is give you the reasons for why we are in a position to change. And I want, let me go back for a second. Let me, let me invite you to, uh, I know you're going to be checking your phone anyway, so why don't you take down my email address uh, and possibly let, send questions or I'll share these slides with you. Because what I've learned and I've been discussing with the, a few of the faculty here is that I really need a campaign. I don't need to sell books. I need a campaign in order to effect change. I need to sign people up. Because what I found, and I'm new to the law, so this was a surprise to me, is that people in the law field said, yes, you do have an idea. That's great. That's great. And it means nothing until you have others standing with you. Until you have others showing enough interest in your idea that they're ready to say we should discuss this idea. Not that we agree with your idea, but that your idea is worth discussing. Only then, apparently in this very difficult field of study called the law, only then do you have an idea that matters, an idea that is worth considering. So I am sharing my email address and my tag, uh, uh, Twitter account, sorry, and my, the tag, your hashtag for this tour of mine, because I am trying to solicit support and interest. Not in my particular idea, you can object to that, but that we should be considering copyright as something that should be serving its original intentions. So I don't need to do Law 101 with you, because I haven't done Law 101, but I imagine in Law 101 when it comes to intellectual, sorry, intellectual property 101, excuse me, when you do Intellectual Property 101, you must be taught that the origin of modern intellectual property is the Statute of Anne in 1710. You were good. I appreciate that. Any kind of nodding is always helpful. <laughs> Here, it's been a little while since I taught. So yes, so the 1710 Statute of Anne, and it was called an act. Do you remember this part? OK. This isn't a test. And, but you can write this down. An act for the encouragement of learning. And John Locke was very influential, although he had passed away by the time he was passed, he died in 1704, because he was an advocate for scholarship, and he was part of that framing, that it was that the purpose of copyright in the original case was an act for the encouragement of learning, not an act to unlock cell phones, an act to protect <laughs> Mickey Mouse ad infinitum, but an act for the encouragement of learning. And when the US picked up that very language, an act for the encouragement of learning. And in the Constitution of the United States, where I have been working, the purpose, Congress has the power to pass laws on intellectual property, to promote the progress of science, constitutionally. Promote the progress of science and useful arts. So the original intent of intellectual property, and of copyright in particular, was this promotion of the progress of science. And we have lost that. And I want to bring it back and I need you to stand up, and I need you to tweet, <laughs> as it were, your interest and support for this idea. Is that, am I being too subtle? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me move into the, the case. So the first case you, I'm, I'm really asking you to do, asking you to support, 
is should we begin to change, think about the law as subject to change. And then I want to give you a particular proposal. Because you don't want to change the law if you don't see any kind of profit from changing the law. You don't want to change the law just to change the law because it's fun. Because it's not. It's a blood sport, apparently, David. <laughs> I just learned today about this. I wore a white shirt. It wasn't, you know, it's not good timing. So I want you to, I want to give an example of how you can change the law. But first I want to give you the case for changing the law. And this all goes back to 19, 20, 19, 2019. In 2019, well, let me give you a little, a little bit of history on this. So for a 25 years, 24 and a half years, I have been working on open access. I had tenure so I could shift. I was a professor of education. And 24 and a half years ago, I just woke up to the idea that there was something hypocritical about teaching in a university about education and getting students excited about research and then telling them they couldn't have any research when they left the university, that we were going to cut their library card in half when they left at graduation and there would be like no more research available to them and was that kind of crazy? I was a school teacher for 10 years. I taught kids to read and to write and to do math on the assumption that they would embrace knowledge for the rest of their lives. And then I joined a profession that was closing access to knowledge, that was supporting the closing off of a certain kind of knowledge that I thought was really valuable, so much so that I did a PhD. <laughs> and that is not a voluntary act. <laughs> That is an act of love of the knowledge. And here I had taught all these kids to read and they weren't going to have access to this. That seemed to me so wrong. So 25 years ago, 24 and a half, when I had tenure, as a professor of education, I kind of turned away from teaching and said, we've got to fix this access to knowledge. And I tried to convince my colleagues, this is actually an education question. Unsuccessful. I tried to convince my colleagues, we should be making our research freely available. Michael came on, <laughs> a few others. So for this period of time, I have been trying a variety of ways of doing this. And all that time, the publishers were always considered to be the problem. In fact, the publishers were the problem. These big corporate publishers, so in, in scholarly publishing, just like in the music industry, in the car industry, we have corporate concentration. And we have the magic number is five, although music's really about three. But we have five major players that own about 50% of the literature. And they were always considered to be, and they were. They would lobby to make it illegal in the United States in 2008, to make it illegal for the National Institutes of Health to require open access after a one-year embargo. And they got caught. Elsevier got caught lobbying in this way, sponsoring a bill, and it stopped doing that. But then in 2019, they appointed a new president, a woman, and that's important, I think, who came up with a new line, which was, we support open access. We are an open access publisher. We see the value of open access, and all the other publishers came on board. So for the first time since I started in this business, of advocating for open access and researching for open access, we had a consensus. A consensus. That is critical. In fact, I learned in my study of the law that there is an iron law of consensus, at least in the United States, that you cannot change copyright without a consensus. And Taylor Swift taught me that lesson. I'll come to Taylor in a minute. Let me hold off on that. Okay. She's kind of my midpoint. <laughs> Revitalization, you know, after the donuts wear off, the sugar high, I cut them off the sugar high, and then I come in with Taylor Swift and it picks you right up. So just let me hold off on, on Taylor Swift and just finish with this consensus. So this consensus changed everything. If we all agree that open access is what is best for science in 2019, oh, wait a second. 2019? I don't know if you remember this. It's kind of foggy for me, too. But then in 2020, we had this pandemic. The publishers opened all of the literature on COVID before it was even called, before the WHO declared it to be a pandemic. Just like that. Because they knew in their hearts that would help. And did we have good results? We had a terrible, we still, I'm facing, you're wise to be wearing masks. We had vaccines 
in a period that we had never had before, of six, four to six, eight months, we were sharing clinical data, the clinical trials data. The genome itself of COVID was shared almost immediately. And it changed the outcomes for all of us and our families. And it was a pretty good natural experiment, a pretty bad circumstance for a pretty good natural experiment on the value of open access. Universal open access, all of the literature, well, not exactly. Vincent LaRiviere pointed out very clearly that it only meant literature that was exactly on the COVID, not all the biochemistry around COVID, not all the extended work in terms of the instrumentation around doing the analysis, but anyway, it was a very strong lesson. And that consensus is something that we can use to get us to open access because we are not getting to open access. I can say that after 24 and a half years, but not with much pride, that we are unsuccessful with this concept. That one third of the literature is freely available now. After 20, Five years, one third of the literature. Again, the more recent work is maybe 50%, but in the biomedical field, it's very uneven from disease to disease what proportion of the literature is freely available. You go to a doctor's office, and the doctor has access to a third, maybe 40% of the literature. Heaven forbid that your condition falls into that other 60 or 75 percent. It gets more bizarre than that, and I'll maybe come to it in a moment, but let me just work on this notion of the consensus. So if we have a consensus for this desired good called open access, and we are failing to get to it, we have a serious problem. But we also have another secondary problem that I'm very much trying to address, and that's the pricing. It's bad enough that we cannot get to open access. It's worse that we're paying more and more each year for it. In fact, you could cynically say, except you're not cynics, of course. You, you've got donuts. <laughs> you're fully supportive. But if you were cynical, excluding the people in this room, if you were cynical, you could say the publishers only came on board because they saw they could make more and more money from it. And I know, Susan, you would agree with that. But it is true and it's not true. It is obvious that they will make money on whatever they do. This is their business. Uh, and it is obvious that open access is better for research and scholarship. But this condition of not getting the desired good at an efficient price, we would call it, in, in terms of the market, in terms of market thinking, is setting the conditions for what I want to argue for the, the basis on which I want to argue for the change. It is a market failure to deliver open access in a timely manner at a fair price. And that's why we need the law to change. Okay, those two conditions, not just the fact that the law has been changed for unlocking cell phones, because that's more important than the future of humanity in terms of the next pandemic, <laughs> but it is that we have a failure of the market so it's not like I'm speaking out of my left-wing side of the brain. It is that I'm recognizing that the market is not delivering the desired good on the part of all parties at a fair price. And I'm ready to say that the law has a responsibility. The law is part of the failure. The law is the one thing that is subject to the popular voice, I would hope, at some point is subject to an expression of a public good at another level, and in this case, is a way to redress a market failure to deliver a public good at a fair price. So the consequence of this is, am I following these points, by the way? <laughs> yeah, sort of. I'll get to this RP part. So the... The consequence of this is my argument, and this was perhaps the least successful part of my argument today in the pre-trial uh, the experiences that I had with the faculty, um, is that the, the law has not kept up with the digital state of access to research. It has kept up with cell phones. Did I mention that already? It hasn't kept up with video games. Did I mention the video game law? Okay, good. It hasn't kept up with research. It hasn't been altered. 
And so this creates an economic uncertainty for the publishers. The publishers have the full force of the law when it comes to subscriptions because they, you know, infringement, the copyright protects and them in terms of infringement of, of copyright. Uh, but when it comes to open access, where there is no infringement, the law is silent. The law is, it's not the law's fault, the law is waiting for us to pick it up and shake it and revitalize it. In this case, as the video game lock makers of the world did. So, this possibility that we could begin to consider how the law can catch up is actually sympathetic to the publishers in a way that, again, did not win me a lot of votes today. Um, and what I'm trying to do is build a, on the consensus. Okay, if you want to change the law, my understanding is you need a consensus, but a consensus is not sufficient. You need to appeal to the interests of the consensus holders, if you like, appeal to their interests, each of them, in a way that doesn't undermine the common goal, in this case, open access. So for the publishers, what I'm saying is that we need a law that addresses their interests in a way that advances open access at a fair price. That might seem contradictory in terms of publishers being greedy, but I want you to give it a, I want you to give it a try. Because the publishers in this case, scholarly publishers due to corporate concentration, by the way, the fault of corporate concentration and the fault of the publishers is the publishers, for sure. They all have responsibility for that. Um, but for 24 and a half years, they've had someone or at least two of us in this room, uh, asking them to consider moving to open access. Uh, Michael mentioned the publishing system that, that we've developed. Uh, this, the Public Knowledge Project is what I created 24 and a half years ago. And the Public Knowledge Project has created software that allows people, and it's free open source software, allows people to build journals. And Canada has hundreds of journals using this, but the world has like 34,000 journals using the software. So I created, and we created, an alternative system, and 34,000 journals were formed, but far more journals are in the hands of commercial publishers because all of my research colleagues, all of the scholars and researchers I work with, not all of them, a good proportion of them, send their work to commercial publishers. They are, and rightly so, caught up in the prestige game. Nature is not using my software. Nature is not open access, unless you have, say, $11,000 for one article, then nature's open for you and your very wealthy colleagues. So we have this situation where the publishers have a law that protects the exclusive rights, but not the open rights. And so the publishers are dragging their feet, understandably, because they have no certainty of the future. So what I need to do, what I needed in my proposal, is to provide them a certainty of future in exchange for immediate open access at a fair price. The two things that I believe we need before the next pandemic. Because at the current rate of open access growing, 30% 25 years, if you do the math, it's going to be decades and decades. Maybe four or five decades, a little bit of a speeding up. And four or five decades is like, what, 8.2 pandemics and an 80% climate catastrophe. Like we need this research open now. There's an urgency. In an age of misinformation, we should be locking up the one information that at least you, you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe it had some value. That seems wrong to me, this guy. So my case then, let me finish my case. My case for open access, so, so what, what's happened is the uncertainty that we have without the legal protection um, is such that the publishers are responding by dragging their heels. They're holding on to subscriptions. Uh, Canada has agreements that lock in subscriptions, but at the same time offer open access options for authors. They're called read and publish agreements, R and P. They're incredibly complicated. And they show the publishers holding on to those subscriptions for as long as possible because the law gives them no bridge. The law does not encourage learning or promote the progress of science in the way that we understand it now because the law is so 1996. No, it's actually 1976. In 1976, researchers got a big concession. 
we are able to go to a photocopier. Some of you will have to ask your parents about this. A photocopier, and we are able to copy an article from a journal, page by page. Who does that? What is that? Now, there's still some uh, the faculty members' offices that are stuck to the very ceiling with photocopies. More credit to them. But that's like kind of yesterday. That's not the future of research. It does not promote the progress of science to copy articles one by one in the, uh, on photocopy. So we need to talk about uh, one more, a couple more factors in terms of this change. One is the price on researchers. If you're a researcher today, and I hope all of you will be if you're not already. At some point, it's a really good sport. I've enjoyed it a great deal. You have this complicated landscape where you can, yes, you can deposit a copy in your institutional repository if it is not the publisher's PDF. Oh, and there may be an embargo, two years for social sciences and humanities, one year for bioscience, except unless it's from a Gates Foundation where there's no embargo, and now the OSTP is in removing the embargo. It's all so complicated, and the researchers are being asked to navigate it. The researchers are good researchers. They're not good publishing navigators. I've spent 24 and a half years studying the publishing business, and I barely get it. And we're asking researchers who spend 24 minutes looking at the contract from a publisher trying to decide how to share their work. And part of the reason we're sharing so little is because it's so complicated. And I want to remove that complication from the researchers. Not from the librarians. This is their trade <laughs> business. I'm sorry, but, but I got librarians. <laughs> sorry, this is what you train to do. And not from the publishers. It's a pleasure and a duty for publishers to negotiate, negotiate complicated situations, and, and I'm not going to change that. But the researchers, stop using the researchers to slow down open access. Stop burdening the researchers with the complexity of making their work available in a way that serves it best. That's unacceptable for me. So we've got uh, a couple. I've already mentioned the changes in the law, so we're good on that point. The law has been changed. This was a revelation to me. I thought the law was like a fixed thing. But 60 times in, in 30 odd years, like twice a year, um, we, uh, yes, okay, yes, good, all right. So it's time to change. So what I want to do then is share with you my proposal. And my proposal has to meet all of the conditions that I've set up so far. It doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, even today, I've had some very interesting counter suggestions about how it can be done. But what I want you to see is that we can do it. I want you to see and I want you to be convinced that we should be considering open access as something that copyright needs to address and has not addressed because it's been so busy addressing video game logs, <laughs> cell phone logs, Mickey Mouse's lifetime, all of these other issues. It's time to address this aspect of, of research. So my proposal, let's get down to the tough stuff. So what I'm proposing, oh, this is Taylor Swift time. I'm sorry, yeah. I wasn't paying attention. So I started on this venture of mine after Taylor Swift took her first steps. Taylor pulled her music in 2014 from Spotify. Do anyone remember this? Oh, oh, this is like, oh, sorry. I should have had a trigger warning. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry. I, I shouldn't have just jumped in like that. Okay. It was a difficult time for me, too. Okay? All Spotify, all Taylor Swift's music was off Spotify. Right now, it's Neil Young and Joni Mitchell. Can you believe it? I, I checked. I just, like, just a part of me just checked to see if I could. No, Neil's still off. It's a different issue. What Taylor did is, and she is one of the leading for me, intellectual property scholars because she has taken she has re-recorded you know this yet her all her music like she has done so many I'm only going to talk about one aspect of this woman's magnificent copyright career and that is when she pulled her music from Spotify so she pulls her music from Spotify in 2014 it catches my attention it catches my attention it was a difficult time and in 2018 the United States changed the law what 
four years later, the United States changed the law. Taylor Swift just pulled her music off and it was like difficult, but then the United States changed the law. It was that difficult only four years later? Yes, they introduced the Music Modernization Act. And that really caught my attention because in 2018, the United States was not going through a great political period. There was this very unfortunate, I can't even mention his name <laughs> at this point because it is a specter haunting that country. The Congress, the word that was used most often was dysfunctional, and the Music Modernization Act, Taylor Swift's name not, is not even in it. The Music Modernization Act of 2018 passed unanimously. And when I saw that, I said, oh my God, you can't change the law. You can change it without dissent. You can change it when you have a consensus in the music industry that allows you to change the law to make sure that Taylor Swift doesn't remove her music again, which was like really reassuring. Why couldn't we do that? And then when I heard the conditions that Taylor accepted, or at least her industry accepted, I was further stunned. This was all new to me, having not done Law 101, or whatever advanced version of contract or copyright intellectual property law this is. Taylor did not want the right to set her own price. Taylor was prepared to have the courts, copyright judges in fact, set the price. She's such a force, and yet she was prepared to, to allow the courts to set the price. That caught my attention. The second thing that caught my attention is she did not want the right to exclude users of her music. She was prepared to let anyone who wanted to perform her music. Now, I'm in a band. This was very good news for me, because we would not do Taylor very well. But she was prepared to let anyone who wanted to, as part of this licensing agreement that I didn't know about and began to learn about, called statutory licensing. And statutory licensing that had these two aspects to it, in which the courts decided on the fee structure, and there was a non-exclusivity to it, it's actually called compulsory licensing as well, because she is compelled, I don't like using that word with Taylor, but she is compelled to let anyone who wants to license her music in order to perform it much worse than she, not even close to how she would perform it, at a fee not set by her. That, to me, was it. That's what we needed. Statutory licensing. Very simple-minded idea on my part, but it could pass in a change of the law, it could give me the price check that we clearly needed, and it could compel a non-exclusivity that would be slightly different. And that's what I want to present to you in terms of, of research and scholarship. So what I did was take Taylor's inspiration, I'm not calling it the Taylor Swift Scholarly Publishing Act, <laughs> and to turn it into a statutory license. Statutory licensing, licensing addresses a market failure. The market is failing to deliver a commonly desired good at a fair price, and statutory licensing allows you to address that. So in the case of research and scholarship, the desired good is not Taylor Swift music. It is immediate, universal, open access. Universal in the sense of all the literature, old and new. And it's at a fair price, fair compensation for the publishers immediately, or not immediately, but fair compensation, to be paid, this is tricky, by the institutional users, by which I mean you and your agents, the librarians, working on behalf of the public in an educational institution that is publicly supported, certainly in this country. But also even at Stanford where I teach, where I talk, it is tax exempt, it's publicly supported. So in that sense that, that the institutional users and funders are already paying the bill, this is no change for them, except for one thing, fair compensation, fair pricing, an ability to go before a judge 
and argue what is fair. Now, the Music Modernization Act uses a concept, introduced a concept that was quite common in the law, but was new to music, of a willing buyer and a willing seller. That's how the judges decide. They don't decide what's fair. They decide, do we have a, a willing buyer and a willing seller? A willing buyer would be like the librarians and the funders saying that we're willing to buy and willing to pay for open access, but also we're willing to pay for high quality publications, research. We're willing to pay for a peer review system. We're willing to pay for the careful selection of editors to provide scholarly oversight. We're willing to pay for an ability to uh, share the data, have data storage. We're willing to pay for back issues because we want the old literature as well as the new literature. And this publishers are willing sellers and they're willing to say, here's what we can sell that for. And there has to be an agreement. There can't be a refusal, but an agreement. And we don't have that right now. And that kind of agreement where we can talk about scholarly quality and the price we pay for it and are not willing to pay for it would introduce a whole new level of discussion. And librarians would be listening to faculty and students about what is it that we really need from this literature. Do we want to have interactive data examples? Do we want to have manipulate, be able to manipulate the graphs and tables, figures and tables? So all these different kinds of questions now become part of the discussion. But the thing that happens immediately is the open access to all of the literature. So what does that involve? Well, it turns out that statutory licensing in the United States was first introduced in 1909 around piano rolls. You know, the early Taylor Swift piano rolls, they were like, they're just collector's items now, if you have any. So it has 113 years of refinement and precedent and court decisions and common law surrounding it. And all of that can be our guide doesn't have to be, but can be our starting point in thinking about this. So I want to propose a change to the law that is not unprecedented, but that is entirely precedent. Entirely been worked out and explored. Entirely with the support of artists and with the support of the industry, with a much more complicated system. Jeremy and I were talking today about the, the multiple, so in, in, in the case of music, there are nine different licenses involved for the performers and for the producers and for the composer. And we're talking about one simple copyright in our field. And so what is it that is that we already have in place to make this possible? The first thing we would need, sorry, what do we need to change? Excuse me, let me, let me get my order here. What we need to change is we need to introduce this notion this only applies to research publications. So using the American example, there are already eight different kinds, eight different, uh, in terms of, of intellectual property, there are already eight different categories of work. This, again, was a stunner for me. When I learned, uh, nothing about video games this night, when I learned that there was a category of work for literary works, and that's where research was stuffed under the poets and, and, art and uh, novelists, so there was me standing with Margaret and Alice. I, was, I loved it. Uh, but it wasn't really helping my research get open. But still, to have the two of them with me was great. But when I discovered that pantomime, yeah, I know. It's exactly the expression on my face when I read it the first time. When pantomime had its own category and research did not, well, I can tell you that I was outraged. I felt like I was trapped in a glass box. <laughs> the pantomime would have its own category of work and research was like stuffed in with some great poets and novelists. Choreography, its own category of work. I thought pantomime was kind of like choreography. Architectural works and drawings, its own category of work. Hello? What was the first thing you drew as a child? It was a house with your family? That's protected. It's a special category. It's research and scholarship, no, nothing. So I want to introduce research publications. It doesn't have to be called that, but I'm using that. Research publications as a category of work because, heck, it is different 
Research publications have their own economy. The author's not paid by the sale of the work. The author's paid by a university or a graduate student grant. And it operates in a whole different economy from the novelists and poets. It's not fair to Alice. God bless her soul. Um, or Margaret. Doing quite well, thank you. It is a different economy a different institutional basis, a different form of tax support, a different regard, and it warrants that. So I want to tailor the law, and this I love this term, tailoring of the law. I want to tailor the law, it's Michael Carroll in my book, tailor the law to serve research publications and introduce it as a category where number nine after pantomime, choreography, architectural works, Dramatic, or my favorite, non-dramatic music, <laughs> which is something I don't want to ever listen to. <laughs> okay, so if the law is changed, if the category is introduced, what else do I need? All right, if I, how do we decide what's a research publication? Isn't it really hard to decide what a research publication? Pamela Samuelson, who some of the legal faculty in this room will know, I uh, thought it would be, it's very hard to draw a line, she told me. But I thought, heck, don't, don't we have a, a profession whose whole career is based on deciding what is a journal that's worth subscribing to? Don't we call them uh, librarians, information scientists, who study the whole scholarly publishing milieu and make decisions about quality? And we would have to set up a board then that would establish a registry. Now, I have to tell you that I had a librarian in Copenhagen so angry at me about this <laughs> that he called me a rank Stalin. <laughs> now, I think he meant rank in the sense of smell, but I don't know for sure. <laughs> he was spitting mad about that because it would be like dictating what is a research publication. But my whole life as an academic, people have been making those decisions. Every tenure and promotion case, people are deciding on what is a real research publication. We can do this. We can master. Okay? The second thing is this licensing collective. This is an interesting thing. This is a collective management organization, a CMO. We have these in many different areas of, uh, in, in terms of how we operate. It's a way of creating a, a trust that is not a trust. It's, not an anti, it's it, outside of the antitrust situation where all the publishers come together, and this is in, in music, these are very common, um, all the publishers come together, and, it, and it's constructed by the law, it's governed by legislation, in order to do two things. One is to ensure a fairness of distribution of the fair compensation to the big publishers and the small publishers. Some people think the big publishers would take all the money. So cynical. And it would also ensure that they weren't operating as a monopoly by sponsoring or supporting new publishers and new journals. They would be taxed to in prevent themselves from being, from being accused of antitrust kinds of action, like excluding new publishers from a rise. So, those are the new things. What about the current things that we already have in place that we don't have to worry about to bring this into law? One is copyright royalty judges. Now, this would be a United States slide. In Canada, we would say a copyright board that had judicial authority that is governed by a judge, in the case of Canada, I just learned today, uh, or run by, uh, sorry, led by a judge, I should say. And so, they, so we already have this mechanism in place. It is not very efficient. And it was repeatedly said to me today in my quick law degree that I took here at Ottawa, uh, that they are very inefficient. But hey, we've got inefficiencies. Like, this would not be something new. We have every library in this country, and CRKN in, in, in many cases, negotiating licenses every year. And it is a messy, expensive process. And so that would not change. Um, but what we also have uh, that the music industry doesn't have is we're really good at counting. We are really, really good at counting big numbers, too. I don't mean just one to ten. Like, we're researchers, okay? We can go big on this. So we have Crossrail, which is an industry organization that does nothing 
but count every publication and every citation and every funding agency and record it, yes, and track it all over the world e by each publisher in each location, each register. And then we even have an organization that counts reading. Counter, get it? Should I explain the title? Why they use, you're good with the title? Okay. Counter is an organization devoted to setting standards for counting. Uh, that, what it means to count. Is it a download? Is it a, uh, is the PDF have to be opened? Is it on campus, off campus? Is it through the library? Is it through another a classroom? So counter establishes the standards. So we have already in place the ways of tracking. The music industry had to develop all of these standards. We've already got them. So we are so ready for stat. No, I don't want to exaggerate. This is a very big lift. No question about it. What would it look like? This is the, the closer slide. If we put all of these pieces together, it's kind of a shocker. I do need to give you a trigger warning. This could kill my argument right now. You've been with me the whole way. And now I'm going to, this next slide, I'm going to, going to lose you. So I just want to say goodbye. <laughs> and if you're going to send me an email that's positive, just do it not right now. <laughs> because it is complicated. But it is complicated because we have put 25 years into this unsuccessfully. It's complicated because we are paying millions and millions of dollars with no end in sight in terms of price increases. And it's complicated because it takes a pandemic right now to free up a small section of the literature to help humanity. And humanity has many, many, many more problems than just one defined by COVID-19. OK? So here it comes. <laughs> it's understood. It takes a moment. It's kind of complicated. So, let me just bring it up to date. In fact, let me start with the easy part. Let's, let's, let's talk about the good news, okay? Because it is kind of heavy. Here's the good news. The authors, for the first time, don't have to worry about the article processing charges of Nature 11,000, an article. They can submit anywhere. They're freed up of all of that burden of figuring out what is open and what is not. And their work is immediately open and they have access to everything. Just in Canada, no, this is the world. We can talk about the, the global aspects of this in a moment, but let me just give you this one part. So they are freed up from all of this shenanigans, and that's really important. That's academic freedom. That is freeing up inexpert opinions about open access and disengagement from the, the technicalities of it. And it is allowing researchers to focus on their work and where it should be published where they think they will be best served by publishing it. The publishers are getting support from this collective agency. The collective agency is getting its money from the libraries and the research funders. The research funders are only paying for the research they sponsor, but they have a right responsibility for that. What funder would sponsor research that can't be shared? What value to the funder is that investment? So they are on the hook to share that work and support it. Now this fair compensation financial system is way too skinny. <laughs> it's way more complicated. It's influenced by usage data. If nobody is reading a journal, zero, no compensation. But if you're a medieval, French medieval historian, your community and usage is going to be lower than if you're an oncology, working in oncology and cancer research. And so we can make those kinds of adjustments on what counts. A high school, in terms of usage, would be below the threshold. Probably. Unless it was your high school, where they were avid, keen research followers. Then maybe it would trip up the, the scale, but probably not. We would adjust it, because high schools shouldn't be supporting the research. So the usage would come in. The fee structure every five years would be a decision made from both all parties. The Research Licensing Collective would have an innovation fund for new journals and new publishers. 
The publications registry would be a debate. A new journal comes along, it would make an appeal to be on the registry. The librarians on the committee would review it, the publishers, there might have to be an appeal. It might take a few years to establish if peer review was really working in that case. There may be a little more transparency in terms of establishing the quality. But we have quality issues in research. And those issues are worth reviewing and worth creating a registry around. So that is the long and the short and the twisted and the circular aspects of this proposal. It's only one proposal to convince you that there are proposals, that we can change copyright because we want to demand immediate, universal, open access at a fair price. Don't we? I know some of you, some of you are going to grow up to be judges. I can see you. You're like, so I'm reserving my judgment. At this point. That's okay. So the case then hinges on the, the complexity of this and the ask. And there are other measures afoot that would be simpler, creating a stronger fair dealing or fair use exception. I'm not suggesting this is the only proposal. But I am suggesting that the time is now that we have a consensus now, and that we've had a global demonstration of the value of open access, and that we don't want to wait for another few decades to arrive at what is best for the work of this institution. Again, it would be a question about integrity. That, <clears throat> excuse me, if we believe the university is making a substantial contribution, why, in the name of the public, with public support, why wouldn't we look at the law of this country and of other countries? Now, we can talk about, and I have some experts here, actually, that can talk about uh, the global distribution of this, how this would work globally. If we have one or two jurisdictions begin to implement a law that introduces statutory licensing into, compo into, sorry, statutory licensing into the Copyright Act, then we can begin to see how this would operate globally. If it were to be the United States and the EU, for example, that would take care of all the major publishers except one, Taylor and Francis, in the UK. Um, but we can talk about the ways in which it would be implemented. But even before that, what I want to say is that introducing this very concept that copyright can be changed for research and the copyright is in fact overdue for a research change, will begin to change things. If we say that we think copyright is right for changing for open access, it begins to work on the publishers and librarians and researchers. Because right now there is no alternative. Right now there is no way we can see the future or end of open access. There is no check on the price increases of publishers. But if we were to raise the specter, in this case, of copyright change that would make pricing a judicial decision that made open access a requirement of the law, then it would begin to affect how people act. Because it would act as a check. And if there was a failure to act, we could, in fact, move on this. So what I'm asking you then is to consider this new possibility. That copyright law is overdue for a change on behalf of open access. And that the group that is assembled here, which I assume to involve the libraries, faculty members, and students, not too many interested members of the public, but maybe a few Taylor Swift fans, <laughs> which means you're a copyright activist already, can begin to make that difference. Can begin to raise, hey, why aren't we talking about copyright? What about the influence of copyright on research and scholarship, professor? What about the possibilities of bringing about change to the libraries through a change in copyright? Where are our advocacy organizations? And so I've come to that point where I am asking 
organizations and faculty members to be counted, not endorsing statutory licensing as I described it with this incredible diagram. That would be like a lot to ask of you, and the graphics aren't that good. The color scheme is way off. What I'm asking is that you would be willing to sign up or to stand up <clears throat> for having open access be considered from a copyright perspective. Well, let me turn that around. To have copyright be a subject of conversation with regard to the public interest in open access. That's all. Because until I can demonstrate that, then this is just one person visiting for 48 hours to this country's capital in order to speak to a warm and welcoming group of donut lovers, <laughs> and it's over. And I've done that before, as Michael mentioned. This time I'm asking for something more. And that is the sense in which we can begin to change the law by raising an awareness of this issue, this possibility. Have we explored, have we considered how the law could better serve the work each of us is committed to, is dedicated to? It's five o'clock in the afternoon. It's probably pitch dark out there, and you're here. And so you kind of owe it to yourself to carry this forward. Thank you.